There's nothing quite like a brazen gangland war to spark a clampdown. Public shootings get citizens riled up, and worried citizens push politicians and police to prove they've not lost control. And that brings the clampdown. Sweeping raids and arrests, police search smashing down doors, and then parading outlaw bikers, gangbangers and mobsters in front of a relieved public. This cycle is playing out right now in dramatic style in Australia, spinning so fast it makes you dizzy. The Mob Reporter here with news of how underworld rivalries over sales turf, ambition and reputation are spilling out of control, and how authorities are tamping it back down by changing their laws and regrouping their forces. Let me tell you about it. There's been another rash of gangland violence over the past 18 months in and around Sydney, Australia's best known city. And it seems to be escalating as a swirl of alliances between biker clubs, crime families and street gangs all jostle for the spoils of the lucrative dope trade. 13 hits in 18 months, and several more that failed to hit their mark, with three recent hits in just two weeks have proved to be too much. Among the targets were the National Sergeant at Arms for the country's strongest biker club, the Comanchero MC, who survived, barely, and two members of the Ahmad crime family, who did not. The mayhem demanded action, and action there was. A huge police task force was unveiled on May 16, 2022. Police! Search warrant! Open the door! It's called Task Force Erebus. It's an ominous sounding name, purposely so. Erebus was one of the primordial deities of the ancient Greeks, the personification of darkness and the shadows, the things that go bump in the night. Police wanted to send a message. The power of the state sits at the top of the food chain. The task force is an amalgamation of police assets working on gang probes. Police! FBI! Open the door! and additional 60 full-time investigators were focused on the violence. The public promise of a clampdown pulled the trigger, metaphorically, on investigations already percolating, directly and tangentially linked to the violence. An early wave of seven arrests in Sydney's sprawling suburbs targeted two of Australia's most powerful outlaw biker clubs, the Comanchero MC and the Rebels MC. Among those arrested was the Sergeant at Arms of the South Coast chapter of the Comanchero, in the mix of those pinched were also members of the Banditos MC and the Finks MC, and three guns were seized. The various bikers, or bikies as they're called down under, face a barrage of charges, from trafficking and possession to weapons burglary and financial crimes. A member of the Finks is alleged to have shot a member of the rebels in both legs inside his home. One Comanchero was arrested with impaired driving. That's quite a spectrum. A suspect who was a British man was pinched after officers knocked on his door and he bolted, but he couldn't outrun waiting officers. More than $300,000 in cash was found in his home and almost $600,000 in his storage locker nearby. He was charged with proceeds of crime and, wait for it, trespassing. Arrests kept coming, day after day, one here, a dozen there, several dozen around the corner. The roots of all the upswing and underworld arrest, police say, is a struggle over Sydney's illicit sales market, inflamed by a changing criminal landscape and overlapping family feuds. In Australia's New South Wales, the drug trade is estimated to be worth $3.7 billion a year. That's more than two and a half billion US dollars. A long-time feud between two powerful crime families the Alamedine clan and their rivals the Hamzy clan has had its ups and downs over the years. Both families, originally from the Middle East, dug deep into the underworld of their new home and prospered, but at significant personal cost. Several have been killed and injured, more have been imprisoned. Their feud raged on the streets and in prison. This beef was between Talal Alamedine and Basim Hamzy, who was the founder of Brothers for Life, a gang built around the Hamzy clan. Bassam's been locked up since 1999, but exerts influence from behind bars. An attempted hit on Ibrahim Hamzi was averted last year when a stolen Mercedes was spotted by officers. It tore away, speeding through traffic lights. When investigators probing that botched hit came knocking for their suspects in December 2021, they weren't around. While these two were eventually arrested, 
This daunting figure, named Masood Zechariah, an alleged leader within the Alamedin clan, is believed to have fled the country by boat. Police had to satisfy themselves by revoking Zechariah's driver's license and seizing his home in his absence. He's rumored to be hanging out abroad with Mark Buttle, the influential but exiled Comanchero, evidence of cooperation between the two groups. The Alamedin clan seems to have forged an alliance with the Comanchero, making for a formidable force. Police say the Comanchero are, quote, Australia's largest organized crime network, unquote. The police pressure at that point quelled things down for a bit, but muting the gunfire didn't end any rivalry or douse any of their passion. Things recently flared up all over again. On April 26, 2022, another Sydney crime boss, a man named Mahmoud Ahmed, but who was known everywhere as Brownie, died in a spray of bullets. He was killed just six months after his release from prison, where he had been serving time for a 2016 gangland killing. Brownie had a lot of enemies. Some of them were old ones from yet another Sydney crime family, and once back out on the street, he continued to make new ones. He apparently had a $1 million bounty on his head, and police repeatedly warned him he was marked for death. Two weeks after Brownie fell, on May 10th at 8 p.m., two Comanchero bikers were gunned down as they left a West Sydney gym. But not just any Comanchero. Terex Ahead, 41, an immensely influential member of the Comancheros, was the likely target. He was the club's national sergeant at arms and a candidate to become the club's next national president, and he had been warned repeatedly he was in danger. Despite multiple hits, he survived. Bullets struck his head, torso, arms, and legs. He's reportedly lost an eye and may need amputations of a limb or two. His 39-year-old brother, Omar Zahed, was killed. Two days later, Rami Iskender was shot and killed outside his home. Iskender was a nephew of Brownie's. His death was the unlucky 13th gangland murder in the last 18 months in Sydney. That seemed the breaking point. Police officials admitted they were facing a dangerous and reckless gang war and launched Task Force Erebus with gusto. Another network allegedly working for the Alamadines, a distribution ring linked to a street gang called KVT, was also hit by police in the Erebus frenzy. Those raids wrapped up a probe that included an Uber Eats style of distribution that police described as a cash cow. That entire network was shuttered by 29 Don raids and the arrests of 18 people on May 24th, police said. Some members were part of a group calling themselves Ready for War. Among the evidence officers collected then were encrypted phones and stacks of SIM cards. Those are what are used to activate mobile phones. Three days later, police arrested a mobile phone store manager, alleging he sold thousands of bogus pre-subscribed SIM cards used by gangsters to operate their phones. The clampdown then got even bigger. Why stop in just Sydney when the whole state is a hotbed of gangsterism? Police estimate 40% of Australia's established gangsters are active in the state, and many left the main centre of Sydney to shake off police attention. Using Task Force Erebus as a springboard, police launched raids around the state. On May 27th, police bragged that Operation Hawk brought 45 arrests, seized 8 guns, a hydraulic press, and more than 20 kilos of MDMA and other substances. Those arrests brought a grab bag of suspects into court, including some who had already been targeted by Task Force Erebus. One man was an alleged member of the Life and Death Outlaw Motorcycle Club. The new clampdown also meant controversial new laws. New South Wales already have firearm prohibition orders. That's a 2013 law under which the police commissioner can prohibit a person from having a gun or ammunition, and once so designated, allows police to search them or their home or their car for compliance without getting a warrant. Police replicated that model to enact drug supply prohibition orders. This allows for no warrant raids and searches of the homes of designated people who have been convicted of a serious drug offense within the last 10 years. As a pilot project, it was introduced in four regions. It seems outrageous by the standards of many countries. 
but as a sign of mainstream support in Australia, the main opposition politicians' complaints were not fear of unchecked police power, but that police powers didn't go far enough. The cops now say many leaders of the factions they've been targeting are behind bars or have fled the country, but their crusade will continue. They're now working their way down the pyramid and promised even more arrests. Please check out my bonus content, my books and other perks on Patreon at patreon.com slash themobreporter. Thanks for watching and please subscribe. <laughs>